Next on the docket, Suzanne Morphew. Now, there's an article out there saying that Suzanne Morphew's body was dumped in a remote Colorado area uh, known as the Boneyard, where apparently a young aspiring Marine uh, was found some months prior. Um, never heard of this. Is this like going to the train station uh, in Yellowstone? Um, I lived in Colorado all my life other than, you know, brief stint in the military. So I'm not really sure, never heard of the Boneyard before, but the mother, I'm sorry, the uh, the body of obviously uh, uh, Suzanne Morphy was dumped in a remote area that some people are referring to as the Boneyard because there was a body found earlier this year and another woman went missing back in May. So of course this area, it's near Moffitt, Colorado, uh, and they were searching for Edna Quintana, uh, who went missing early time in early May. And they've also found the Marine, the remains of a uh, young Marine or young guy that was going to go into the Marines by the name of uh, James Montoya. Um, so this particular area, some people seem to think it's a good place to go. Now, let's face it. If you've ever been to Colorado, particularly that southwestern part of Colorado, uh, it's kind of like Idaho. Um, just pick a spot. Not saying to do it, but if you were going to dump a body out there, you could pick a spot, find a road, go up there, little shallow grave. You don't have to do that. The mountain lions and everything else, the bears would would, would get the remains. But the reality of it is, I think people don't watch a little too much Yellowstone. Okay. Uh, the Boneyard, really? Um, now, obviously, what's the next step? The family has issued a statement. Um, when I say the family, you got the family of Suzanne Morphew, her sister and brother. Uh, then you have uh, the family of um, Barry Morphew and his daughters issuing a statement saying how disappointed they are that uh, the remains of Suzanne uh, was found because they thought that she was actually coming home. I told you, uh, I'm not sure. Let me know if you think you believe that particular scenario, if you ever thought it was going to take place. But let's face it, Suzanne Morphew did not ride her bike, fall down a hill, get dragged by mountain lions, some 50 miles away and then placed in a shallow grave only to be found three years later. Now, obviously, something nefarious, foul play has taken place. Now, I don't recall, I don't recall, okay, in any time during the investigation and stuff that we've received through the affidavit for the arrest warrant that they believed that Barry Morphew drove to this wooded area. Now, we give him the presumption of innocence like we do everybody here on this show. And they're entitled to that presumption of innocence unless and until they are convicted or they plead guilty in a court of law. But in this particular case, I don't recall anything saying that Barry was in that area. So I don't remember anything that says that Barry Morphew was there. So the question is, was it somebody working with somebody that didn't like Suzanne Morphew? I mean, he, she had a boyfriend, she had a husband. We also know that there was some DNA found in the car that came back to a sex offender from Arizona. I don't know. We're going to have to wait and see what the police are going to do. But let's hope, let's hope they get it right. Because you can't go around accusing people of doing things and not being able to back it up. That's what our system requires. As a pet owner, you want to give your furry friend the very best. That's why baked in Colorado CBD infused dog treats are the perfect choice. These delicious treats not only taste great, but they also provide a wide range of health benefits for your pet. CBD has been shown to have many positive effects on dogs, including reducing anxiety, alleviating pain and inflammation, and improving overall wellness. Baked in Colorado's treats are infused with premium, full-spectrum CBD oil, meaning your pet will benefit from the whole plant extract. Not only that, but baked in Colorado's treats are made with all-natural human-grade ingredients so you can feel good about what you're giving your pet. They're also free from wheat, corn, and soy, making them a great option for dogs with food sensitivities. Baked in Colorado CBD-infused dog treats are the perfect way to support your pet's health and well-being. With various flavors, including peanut butter, pumpkin, and bacon, your dog will love them too. So why wait? Head to www.bakedincolorado.com today and order your dog a bag of these delicious and nutritious treats. Your pet will thank you for it. Next on the docket, let's talk about the Delphi murder suspect. Well, the Attorneys for Richard Allen, the suspect, the defendant in the Delphi murder cases, well, they are asking, as you may recall, we did talk about their extensive 
brief as it relates to an alternate suspect that all of these uh, crimes were committed against uh, Abby Williams and Libby German uh, by some sort of Nordic religious cult. Well, the prosecutors apparently, according to the defense, haven't been turning over all of the evidence that they believe that is in existence. And the defense believes that the prosecutors are slow walking the discovery in this particular case. The prosecutors um, are being asked, or they're, I guess I should say more accurately, the defense attorneys are asking that the judge give the prosecutors until November 1st to turn over whatever the evidence they have uh, so that they can properly uh, prepare for this case. Now, the other uh, thing that is interesting is that the defense attorneys have stated that the Indiana State Police have now reopened their investigation. Could it be because of the motion that was filed by the defense? Well, we'll have to wait and see. Obviously, like I said, the motion uh, that was filed by the defense said that Abby Williams and Libby German were killed in a ritualistic sacrifice. Now, we went through, I think, the first 36 pages last Tuesday night on our live show. There's 136 pages total in there where the defense outlines their theory of this alternate suspect or suspects, basically saying no one could have possibly done this crime in the time allowed being just one person, one individual. So we will have to wait and see where that heads next. Is Sam Bankman freed? Now, obviously, we're going to give Sam Bankman freed the presumption of innocence, which every defendant deserves in a case. And well, just about a year after he was arrested, old Sam Bankman freed, and he's not that old. He's 31. His trial is uh on. His trial is underway in a Manhattan uh, courtroom there in federal court. Now, obviously, he's accused of uh, embezzling funds from FTX customers and funneling that money to a hedge fund that he allegedly controlled and made some um, illegal exchanges between himself and other uh, companies. Anyway, uh, obviously, trial prep was a little bit uh, chaotic for Sam Bankman fried because he got his bond revoked and had to prepare for the last uh, month or so in custody where he didn't have access to all the records. And obviously the preparation time is much more difficult uh, when you're preparing a client in custody, particularly when you're looking at spending 115 years in prison, you like to be prepared. Now, Sam Bankman fried has ditched his uh, big bushy hair that he was known for and um, apparently wanted to look like a civilized human being when it came to trial. And he uh, cut his hair uh, and uh, actually combed it. So he's got that going for him. Now, the thing I want to really talk about with this is the fact that the case is literally ready to start uh, because jury selection in federal court is very different than it is usually in state court. State court, the judges let you talk to the jury. You get an hour. You get to do whatever. In federal court, the judges do most of it. You, The defense has to submit questions if the judge is either going to ask the questions for the attorneys or basically approve their questions that they get to ask. Uh, for the jury. And in this particular case, the uh, potential jurors are going to be asked questions regarding whether uh, they've had any issues with uh, Bitcoin. Did they think that it was basically a scam? Uh, you know, what are their experience uh, with it? The point is, it moves really fast. Let me give you an example of the jury selection process. Um, when I did one of my first federal trials uh, about 23 years ago, all right? The judge did all their general questions. You're a resident, you do, you know, you can read, speak, and understand the English language. Yes, yes, yes. You give every side the presumption of innocence. Yes, yes, yes. Everybody nods their head. And the first juror, the judge points at him and says, you can be fair and impartial, can't you? And the guy says, yes, your honor. Fine, good to go. Next juror. Anything, any reason why you can't be fair and impartial to each party is if I were you to be fair and impartial? No, sir. Boom. Uh, jury selection took all of about 30 minutes. So big difference in state court. That's why these cases are moving uh, so quickly. Uh, as At a case that sh of this nature, a year out, and it is already a trial. That's the way things normally go in the federal system. Lori Ballow has a new attorney, and he has filed an amended notice of appeal. Now, as you know, anyone's convicted of a crime in a criminal court in the United States has a right to an automatic appeal. And obviously, Lori Vallow is going to do that. 
Now, the preliminary statement in the amended notice of appeal remains the same. The issues. First, did the court err in its order dated April 11th, wherein the court found that the defendant, Lori Vallow, after spending 10 months in a mental hospital, was competent to stand trial? Next issue. Did the court err in its order dated November 15th of 2022, wherein the court denied the defense expert's request to send the defendant back to the mental hospital rather than proceed to trial. And I think this is going to be the big issue. Was the defendant's constitutional and statutory right to a speedy trial violated by the government's repeated request for a continuance? Was the defendant's constitutional and statutory right to a speedy trial violated by the court's trial setting? And did the court err in denying the defense challenges for cause of trial jurors due to bias or hardship during jury selection? And did the government commit fundamental reversible error in its opening statement to the jury? Did the court err in allowing the government to produce evidence of other crimes or acts against Lori Vallow under Rule 404B? That's the evidence of other crimes, wrongs, or misconduct. And in this particular situation, constitutionally, if Lori Vallow wins, the case is probably dismissed against her. The evidence about all the other stuff coming in to show some sort of uh, pattern, absence of mistake, modus operandi. That's where courts get in trouble. And I've always said, if the government has a strong case, and let's face it, Lori Vallow got convicted. The government really didn't need the 404B evidence, but they always push it. And that's usually why it comes back. Why do cases come back on appeal? 404B evidence and jury instruction issues. Next, did the court err in allowing the jury to hear statements of co-conspirators but then rule in jury instructions that the government need not prove those persons were part of the conspiracy. Interesting issue as well. Plus, when the grand jury indictment puts the defendant on notice that she is charged with a conspiracy involving five or more people, can the trial court ignore that finding and intercede, proceed, and instead, and instead proceed with standard conspiracy jury instructions? And did the government commit fundamental reversible error in its closing statements to the jury. And then finally, did the court err when it granted without a hearing the government's objection to the defense request for the review of all mitigation evidence submitted by the defense for sentencing? And should a new sentencing hearing be held due to the sentencing court not reviewing all the mitigation evidence submitted by the defense? And then did the sentencing court abuse its discretion by ordering the defendant to serve three consecutive fixed life sentences without parole? And did the sentencing court abuse its discretion when it ordered the defendant who had been found indigent, qualified for a public defender, and had just been ordered to serve life in prison without parole to pay $165,000 in fines and court costs? Now, they also, when they did the notice of amended appeal, they had to put in all the court dates beginning back on May 26th of 2021, and they had to indicate who the court reporter is. So who is this new attorney? The new attorney is a guy by the name of Craig Durham. Now, he is licensed to practice in both the state of Idaho as well as the federal courts there in Idaho, uh, specifically the Ninth Circuit and the United States Supreme Court. His current practice focuses on civil litigation and all phases of criminal defense, including trials, appeals, post-conviction parole, and habeas corpus matters. Let's face it, he is an appellate guy. Most appellate guys, really usually smart. And this guy, Mr. Durham, he was a staff attorney at the U.S. District Court in Boise for 10 years, and he worked closely with the federal judges on death penalty matters, as well as prisoners' civil rights cases. He's also been a trial and appellate uh, public defender as well. Graduate from law school, University of Kansas in 1996, and he is also a member of the Idaho Association of Criminal Defense Attorneys and the Idaho Trial Lawyers Association, which means he does some civil work as well. So, smart guy, gonna take on the new uh, role as Lori Vallow's new attorney. Now remember, on appellate cases only matters what is on the record, what has been submitted to court, what has been admitted into evidence. All the other stuff that you hear about on the evening news doesn't really matter. Only what's in the record. And why that is that significant? Oftentimes, people think, well, I want to supplement the record. This didn't get in. 
You don't get to add things you don't you didn't introduce at trial. Um, you don't get to raise issues if they weren't uh, raised and or objected to on the record. Other than that, it's not coming in and you can't argue it. So we'll see when the briefs are finally file, filed, uh, which will probably be, I would say, eight months to a year down the road. We'll actually get to see what issues uh, the appellate attorney is the believes is the strongest issue uh, at that time. Did the prosecutors withhold evidence in the Delphi homicide case? Well, the defense seems to think so. Now, according to a recent filing by Richard Allen's attorneys, they are accusing the police of withholding evidence involving a professor at Purdue University. As you may recall, the defense filed a motion saying that, you know, obviously uh, this was a ritualistic killing in the Delphi case and the defense had cracked the code uh, that this was some Odinistic um, religious cult-like killing. Uh, there were symbols. Well, it turns out, or at least according to the defense, um, the Carroll County Sheriff, Tony Liggett, swore under oath back in August of 2023 that a professor at Purdue did not believe that the sticks on the bodies were Odinist symbol. Well, the defense went on to say that the prosecutor, Nick McClellan, allegedly told the defense the prosecution was unable to identify the professor as of September 6th of this year. Well, Allen's attorneys then claimed that state trooper Jerry Holloman said in the months after the girl's murder that the professor was identified as Jeffrey Turco. And he said that it was not Odinism or any type of cult worshiping whatsoever or any type of group that would have conducted the crime. Obviously, that goes against the defense theory. And the prosecutors abandoned the cult theory uh, at that time after speaking with this professor. Well, the defense then submitted a filing, like we talked about, as to why they believe the girls were uh, ritualistically sacrificed back on uh, September 18th. The next day, the defense claims that Holloman was able to find the Purdue professor and interview him. Holloman says he allegedly said he was working to set up the interview with Turco for several weeks despite defense claims that it would have coincided with the same time that the prosecution claimed that they could not identify Turco. Now, the defense says there is a taped statement from Turco saying it was a given that the pattern of sticks found at the crime scene was someone trying to replicate Germanic runic script. Now, Turco went on to uh, bring in outside counsel from Harvard University who agreed with the deduction. Now, Turco went on to say that he could certainly imagine that this was somebody's idea that when you do a human sacrifice, you carve runs. Um, then there are some poetic sources that would sort of support the idea that somebody might have come across. That scenario seems entirely plausible to me. So there you go. Who knows? The defense claims that the prosecution has sent countless hard drives, flash drives, and disks with hundreds of pages of paperwork between September 8th and September 27th. It claims the interview with Turco was on a thumb drive delivered on September 27th and was only marked with the professor's name and not his title. Now, in these court documents, Allen's attorneys claim several people with direct ties to Odinism were dismissed as potential suspects early in the investigation without reason. Now, the defense claimed one of the people allegedly cleared by investigators early in the investigation had social media posts with imagery that matched what the defense claims were pagan symbols at the crime scene. And upon seeing these images, an Indiana State Police investigator allegedly requested another interview be done with the potential suspect. But Allen's defense attorneys do not believe that the police ever followed up with that investigation. Allen's defense claim another person who has ties to this Odinism also confessed to a relative that has been involved in the murder and even spat on one of the girls at the crime scene. This person's alibi allegedly did not hold up and the relative later passed the polygraph test when questioned about what he had told her about his involvement, according to the defense motions that have been filed. That person has also been cleared. And of course, Allen's attorneys claim that he is being used as a scapegoat to get a arrest right before the sheriff was due for seeing ladies and gentlemen, if in fact that was withheld uh, 
that certainly makes the prosecution look somewhat not great. But as we've seen, when you get small towns jurisdictions with huge cases like this, they have document management issues. When you have a large case like this, whether it be on the prosecution or the defense, you literally have somebody that is responsible for indexing and sorting all of this discovery so you know what the heck is in the discovery and where to find it and what is what are they talking about so that you can reference it. Half the battle in these big cases is simply being able to find the information that is there. We'll see how that goes.